uh, that it's signed by you on the 19th of May of this year, uh, and you have um, signed the um, author's statement confirming that it's your own work uh, and that it's true to the best of your knowledge and belief. And is that still the case? That's still the case, yes. Thank you very much. Um, we can take that down. Dealing next with your qualifications and extensive career history, and I'm only going to concentrate uh, for the time being on the highlights as they are relevant to this inquiry. Uh, you are a trained medical doctor um, obtaining your BA and MD in the United States, and you, are, uh, you have a diploma in, in medical epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, in 1976, you worked for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, investigating the first Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1976. Uh, you then worked uh, in your first stint for the World Health Organization between 1989 and 2000, Republic of the Congo in 1976. Uh, you then worked uh, in your first stint for the World Health Organization between 1989 and 2009. And during that 20-year period, you headed the World Health Organization global response to SARS-CoV-1, the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Then in 2009, uh, you worked for the United Kingdom Health Protection Agency as a non-executive chair, um, working closely with the chief executive during the response to the H1N1 influenza pandemic that we know as swine flu. Uh, you then transferred uh, to Public Health England in 2013, again as a non-executive chair, uh, and um, during your uh, stint there, you accompanied the PHE team in 2014 to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to discuss and review the data on the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome COVE outbreak, we know that as MERS, uh, and to offer technical support during the course of that investigation. Um, you have more recently been, we been working again with the World Health Organization uh, and from 2017, you have been the chair of the Strategic and Technical Advisory Committee on Infectious Hazards, uh, and uh, you are currently Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. That brings us up to date. Thank you. Um, over the course of your career, you've published over 275 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on communicable diseases, um, and you are the editor of the Control of Communicable Diseases Manual. Um, in preparing your report for us, Professor, you have also provided at the end of the report a bibliography and list of references. We don't need to go to that now. But you've also been good enough to consider additional material which the inquiry has obtained during its preparation for these hearings, um, a list of which has been provided to core participants and some of which I will take you through during your evidence this morning. Thank you. Right. Um, in terms of the scope of your report, um, that is set out in a series of instructions which appears at Annex 2. Again, we don't need to go to it now, uh, but in summary, you have been asked to assist in the following areas. Uh, the virology of coronavirus viruses and an explanation of the difference between SARS-type viruses and other viruses, including influenza. Um, the uh, epidemiology of COVID-19, that's SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, including its zoonotic origin and its first detection, and an explanation of the method by which COVID-19 is transmitted uh, and how our understanding of that uh, has changed over the course of time. You've also been able to identify and provide descriptions of some of the UK bodies concerned with threats, uh, and some international organisations uh, dealing with uh, the global assessment of public health emergencies. All right. Well, having dealt with all of that, let's start uh, with the basics, please, Professor Heyman. Uh, what are coronaviruses? Well, coronaviruses are viruses. And viruses, unlike bacteria, cannot be seen under a routine examination with a light microscope. They need an electron microscope. 
They're very tiny particles that can only be visualized that way. A coronavirus is like a sphere surrounded by fatty material. And inside that sphere is the genetic material of the virus, the RNA, ribonucleic acid. Yes. And on the surface of that fatty material, that ball, there are spikes, which are protein, and those are the spike protein of the coronavirus. And those spikes are what hooks on to a receptor on a human cell. To reproduce, a virus has to use that receptor. Um, shall I continue? With yes, that? please. To reproduce, a virus must enter the cell through the receptor. Yes. And then it takes over the mechanism of the cell and reproduces itself using the cell's reproductive mechanisms. All right. And the spikes that you have described, do they have the appearance of a crown? Uh, and is that the reason why it's called coronavirus? That's exactly Corona right, that yes. Crown. Right, thank you. How many types of coronavirus are there in animals? Well, it's not known exactly, but there are probably over 200 coronaviruses that are around the world. It's a very common virus in, animal, in the animal kingdom. We heard yesterday um, f from um, uh, doc Dr. Charlotte Hammer and mm -hmm. Professor Jimmy Whitworth that um, so far as um, animals are concerned, coronaviruses appear to be common in bats and cats and camels. Is that right? That's right. They're in many, many animals, including even whales, for example, also have um, coronaviruses. So they're a very common virus in the animal kingdom. Uh, are they common in domesticated animals? Uh, they, they have been shown to be able to infect domesticated animals. It's not believed that they're common in domesticated animals, except for um, animals which are raised in animal farms where there isn't a proper sanitation. All right, well, we'll come to deal with, okay. with those um, mm -hmm. farms and wet markets yes. um, in a moment. For how long have coronaviruses been present in animals? Well, it's really not known. They were, they were first identified in humans, for example, back in the 1960s. Yes. And it's known before then that they were in animals and that sometimes they caused outbreaks of infection in animals. But it's only recently since the coronaviruses of the 21st century, SARS, for example, SARS coronavirus 1, yes. it has really been intensively studied in animals. All right. And how easily do they transmit between animals and between species of animals? They transmit fairly easily between animals um, in, in the same family. Um, we know that from studies that have been done with camels, for example, studies that have been done uh, that showed that minks were able to transfer coronaviruses to each other. And it, it's known that they can transmit fairly easily in the animal kingdom. Is there transmissibility between animals any indication of the ability or likelihood that a coronavirus can jump the species barrier between animals and humans? Well, jumping the species barrier is a very um, complex issue, really. There have to be a series of risk factors that line up in such a way that this jumps the species barrier. And so coronaviruses do, from time to time, jump the species barrier. And when they do, other viruses as well, it's not known what they will do in humans. Sometimes a virus enters humans and goes no further. Rabies is a good example from a dog to a human. Right. Other times a virus can enter humans like the Ebola virus or some other virus, cause a small outbreak, disappear, and then reemerge. And finally, some like HIV in the last century emerge from animals into humans and then they become endemic, a regular uh, virus within humans. Right. In fact, all infections in humans are thought to have come at one time or another from an animal, including tuberculosis, including many common diseases. So what are the common risk factors that need to align in order to cause a, a spillover or a zoonosis into humans? Well, those risk factors depend on many different situations, really. Um, the risk factor uh, may be that the animal is infected, that it's being intensively raised in animal farms, right. and then people who are working on those farms could become infected, or if the, the animals are sent to a live market, then people who purchase those animals could be infected. It's not known what all the risk factors are, but what is known is that the animal and human kingdoms 
have to be maintained separate as well as possible. Right. Thank you. Um, one of the um, documents that, that you've been good enough to look at is a, is a witness statement that's been provided to the inquiry by Professor Mark Woolhouse. In his book, The Year the World Went Mad, uh, he says that new human viruses usually come from animals and most of them don't spread well between humans. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Right. And he also says that coronaviruses are generally more transmissible amongst humans compared with other zoonotic viruses, and that is why they were high on the list of viruses to worry about. Do you agree with that? They do transmit fairly easily in some instances, but some coronaviruses don't transmit easily from human to human. It depends on where they reproduce in the human. If they reproduce low in the lungs, then it takes a deep cough or a medical procedure that causes droplets to transmit. If they reproduce in the upper nasal passages, then it's very easy to transmit. So they're not all the same. Right, so that there's a variance. Um, could you explain to us, please, the process by which a virus becomes endemic in humans? A virus becomes endemic when it spreads throughout human populations and is able to sustain its transmission from human to human. Yes. Okay. And, and what factors might contribute to a virus becoming endemic? Uh, it's a characteristic of the virus, for one thing, that yes. virus is its transmissibility, its ability to transmit. And it's also the population which is infected, if it's receptive to the virus and doesn't have protection against it, it can transmit. If there's a population that has solid immunity against a virus, uh, then it can't transmit further. Right. Um, you were good enough in the course of your report to describe to us the, the four coronaviruses which are endemic in humans. Um, for the record, they are 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKUI. Um, what do those letters and numbers mean? Is there, is, there any, is there any format behind the nomenclature? There's clearly a format be, behind them, and it depends on when they were named what that right. format was. There's an international taxonomy group which does name viruses, and they have altered the way they do that periodically. So I can't explain exactly what each one means, but they do have a name, and that name is with them today. All right, thank you. Um, how severe or, or how mild are the upper respiratory infections caused by those coronaviruses? Those coronaviruses generally cause a common cold. Right. They're common cold viruses. So fairly mild. They're fairly mild, yeah. except in some people who might have comorbidities or the elderly who are debilitated because they're immune to common colds, and those common yes. colds are coronavirus. Some it's for coronaviruses. Well, there are no vaccines available. In fact, they're considered to be very mild viruses. Yes. And so the usual remedies that are used to treat a common cold are used to treat them. What are the routes of transmission for them? The routes of transmission are from the nose or the nasal passages through a sneeze or a cough on another person. Droplets and particles, aerosolized particles. And how long would it take for there to be long-term immunity from, from those for coronaviruses? Well, long-term immunity, I'd rather talk about population immunity. Population immunity yes. is when the majority of the population has had infection, has developed antibody or response to that. Is that also sometimes known as herd immunity? They're different. Herd immunity is an immunity which um, protects against reinfection. Yes. Or it's a vaccine that protects against infection. And with the SARS coronavirus 2, we don't have either of those factors um, available. So in fact, herd immunity at present cannot be established from the SARS coronavirus 2. All right, and, and what's the difference between that and population immunity? Population immunity is general under, understanding of all the population immune systems of the virus right. with a response with antibody usually, and therefore that population immunity in the case of the SARS coronavirus 2 prevents serious illness and death in most people. Right, 
I'd like to ask you some questions now about um, the procedure that you set out in paragraphs 18 and 19 of your report. We don't need to look at them, but it's the molecular clock analysis mm. that uh, was undertaken of coronavirus OC43. First of all, Professor, can you explain to us what the molecular clock analysis mm -hmm. is? Yes. Molecular clock analysis is an attempt to understand the rate of mutation of a virus. So, so from the animal into the human? No, the rate of a mutation in a human or Within in Within a animal. human, right. Yeah. Okay. Now, what was done in 2004, and which was very important uh, to note, and is the fact that a group of molecular biologists calculated a rate of mutation of human coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus, no, I'm sorry, of human coronavirus, OC43. Yes. And they calculated that rate of mutation by taking all the known specimens that they could find of OC43 virus from 1950s onward. They genetically sequenced them, and each one had a slight difference in its genetic structure, and that's a mutation. Yes. And so they calculated a rate of mutation of that virus going forward to 2003. Yes. They did the same thing with the virus that comes from cattle because cattle were the source or the expected source of OC43. Originally. In humans, yeah. yes. And so they calculated a rate of mutation in cattle as well. And then they took those rates of mutation and worked them backwards from the present time yes. to where both of those viruses would have looked the same, where they wouldn't have mutated. And that occurred between 1850 and 1890. In 1888, 1889, there was a pandemic called the Russian influenza. And these molecular biologists hypothesized that this was the emergence of OC43 because the pandemic that occurred was not exactly what occurs with influenza. There were many deaths, a million deaths in a very small world, but it caused neurological symptoms in most persons. Right. And so they hypothesized that this was the emergence of OC43, which then became a virus which causes the common cold today because of population immunity, which is protecting against serious illness and death. So by using the molecular clock analysis, they were confident uh, to, to within a certain time period of when um, the disease jumped into the human population. That's correct. They used three different methods, and they came out with the same with each of these methods. Right. And has that procedure been undertaken in relation to what we now know as COVID-19? There was an attempt by some molecular biologists in the U.S. to calculate a molecular, to do a molecular clock analysis of SARS coronavirus 2. Yeah. And in doing their analysis, they went backwards from the time when it was first identified to where it might have been very close to the virus that's similar in bats and they came to about a period of October 2019. But this is just one of many hypotheses, as you know. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask you a series of questions about 20th century coronaviruses. So we'll start with SARS, move on to MERS, and then um, finish with uh, COVID-19. At paragraph 21 in your report, you tell us that SARS is thought to have emerged from an animal likely to be a civic cat in a live animal market in the Guangdong province of China sometime late in 2002. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And is it thought to have resulted from a one-time mutation of the virus reproduced either in the animal host before transmission to humans or in humans after the emergence had occurred? That's correct, yes. Is it right that the presence of antibodies in the blood of workers in live animal markets suggests that they had previously been infected with other coronaviruses which had not gone on to transmit human to human? That's correct. That comes from a study which was done by Chinese after the SARS outbreak in 2003. Right. And from the live animal market in Guangdong, um, SARS went on to spread amongst health workers in provincial health facilities through a combination of close physical contact with infected patients and medical procedures that cause 
pulmonary aerosols, is that right? Yes, that's correct. The Chinese were never forthcoming at the beginning with their information, but this is the assumption. Right. What sort of medical procedures um, produce pulmonary aerosol? Mm -hmm. Well, when there's a severe respiratory infection, such as SARS coronavirus, um, there is a lot of mucus that builds up in the lungs. Yes. And to get that mucus out to help the patient breathe easier, uh, there's an infusion uh, through the nose of, and a tube of saline, which is salt water, uh, yes. at, at, uh, body um, salt water. And then it's, um, the, the lungs are flushed out, the, the, the water is pulled out, and along with that is the mucus that's been softened and absorbed by the water, and droplets are many times caused as a result of that. And are the aerosols generated by that procedure the same or smaller or lighter than aerosols generated by normal voice projections, such mm. as speaking loudly or singing? I think it's useful to look at an aerosol as being on a spectrum of droplets, which are heavy and fall, to lighter particles, which are carried by the air to very light particles. So it's a whole range of things. And these particles contain virus. Right. And what stops the, the virus from spreading? The virus is able to, to transmit and cause infection as long as the surrounding material, which is many times mucus, is moist. Right. If it dries out, the virus can no longer infect. So is that why ventilation um, assists in, in preventing transmission, because the airflow will, will, will assist in drying out the particles? That's correct. All right. At paragraph 21 in your report, you say that there was substandard infection prevention and control in the Guangdong health facilities. How so? Well, all we know is that the graph that the Chinese finally produced for this outbreak shows that health workers became infected very early in the outbreak. Health workers then continued to become members and other patients. And one of those health workers actually came out of Guangdong province into Hong Kong in February of 20, of 2003-2003. And from him, the virus was spread to people staying in the same hotel and it spread around the world. So health workers are very important always in emerging infections because they don't recognize that they're a new disease oftentimes. Yes. Do you know, for instance, Professor, whether or not those health workers were routinely wearing PPE, such as face masks or, or shields? I think it can be assumed that early on they weren't because what the Chinese indicated <clears throat> when they finally opened up to providing information is they thought that this was influenza. Right. And they therefore were not worried that it was a new infection. Okay, thank you. Um, so SARS-CoV-1 was first identified as a novel coronavirus by genetic sequence, sequencing in March of 2003, um, which was about three months after its emergence. Um, do you have any comment to make on the length of time that it took to, to identify as a novel coronavirus? Well, the virus was first isolated from a patient in February, yes. in late February, and so it was very rapid, in yeah. fact, that it was understood that it was a coronavirus. Which countries were affected by SARS? Well, there were, uh, initially there were about seven countries were infected because these were people who were staying on the same hotel. Yes. And I think in my testimony I've said it goes to, it went to 21 or 22 different countries. And that included uh, countries around the world. The, the good, the good, if there was good in this outbreak, was that it didn't appear to make its way into Africa where surveillance might not have detected it and it might have spread even further than it did. Yeah. And you've described the, um, the, the virus reproducing um, deep in the lungs, which would require uh, deep coughing or a pulmon pulmonary procedures to create the droplets or aerosols that you've described. Um, was that a major factor in the control of SARS? I believe it was, yes. There were several factors that were uh, important. Number one, SARS coronavirus 1 is not transmissible or highly transmissible until two or three days after the onset of signs and symptoms. Right. Unlike SARS coronavirus 2. 
Okay, is that, is that the incubation period? That's the period from, um, no, the incubation period is the period from infection to onset, to onset of symptoms. onset of symptoms, symptoms. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the factors. It wasn't transmissible early. Right. After, it was only transmissible after signs and symptoms developed. Right. The second thing, it produced, reproduced deep in the lungs, and therefore was very difficult to transmit. There yes. had to be really deep coughing and close contact with others. And finally, um, there was a willingness of the world at that time to work together. And so countries agreed not to travel to places where there were uncontrolled outbreaks of SARS coronavirus 1, which included Singapore, Hong Kong, yes. and Canada. And so the outbreak was one that was contained rapidly, and I think you could say that that virus now is gone from human populations. It's been eradicated. Thank you. During the evidence of Professor Whitworth and Dr. Hammer yesterday, we heard about something called the case fatality rate. Yes. Um, is that the number of confirmed deaths caused by a virus in relation to the number of confirmed infections? No, confirmed cases. Confirmed cases, yes. sorry. Yes, yes. Um, and the infection fatality rate um, is less certain because there are those who may be infected asymptomatically, that's et cetera. Correct, so that yes. does, that's not based upon confirmed cases. That's All correct, right. yes. Now, it, it, the case fatality rate of SARS was, you tell us in your report, <coughs> close to 10%. That's correct. Um, in comparison to case fatality rates for MERS, which we're going to move on to in a moment, which was about 35%, and the case fatality rate for COVID-19, which is around about the 1% mark. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain to us um, what, what danger lies in the phenomenon of underreporting and how that has to be factored in, in determining either the case fatality rate or the infection fatality rate? Yes, well, um, in, in infection fatality rate, it's very difficult to know all the infections unless you test the entire population. Yes. And so the infection rate, case fatality rate, would be the number of deaths from that infection based on the whole population that has infection. Case fatality rates are based on a case definition. And a case definition describes what a disease is thought to look like by the persons who develop that case definition, usually the public health community. Then, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> Sorry. Then all cases that are fit that case definition must be tested yes. and must be shown to have that infectious agent. And is that a laboratory test? That's a laboratory test, test, yes. And then the case, the death rate is those people who were shown to be infected who died. So they're included in the case number, yeah. but they're a separate number there, the fatality number as well. All right. Now, you've described there a case description. Um, is that the uh, symptoms that have to be present in order for a case to, to warrant a, 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 the description? That's right. In an outbreak investigation or whenever there's a new disease, a case definition is rapidly developed based on what's known at that time. But, but that would change over time. Absolutely. It, it can change over time, and it generally does change over time. Um, could we display, please, INQ 30198953? I think you've had an opportunity of, of looking at this before, Professor Heyman. This is a table which has been taken from a video lecture that Professor Chris Whitty gave to Gresham College London on how to control a pandemic in 2018. Now, if we just familiarize ourselves with what we have. The vertical axis shows the level of transmission and the horizontal axis shows the level of mortality. And if we start from the least serious, moving up to the most serious, bottom left-hand corner, low transmission and low mortality, the box in green, um, Professor Whitty has said, not worth worrying about. So that, that is the least serious um, table, but part of the table, isn't it? If, if, a, if, an, if a pandemic is thought to have low transmission and low mortality, that's the least serious of the four that we see here. Um, 
The next in seriousness it is the box above, so the, the yellow box above, which is high transmission but low mortality rate. Do you agree with that? Yes. And the example that's been given here is the H1N1 2009 <coughs> swine flu, which we see, according to this table, has a mortality rate of 0.3%, but between 10 and 200 million cases, so very high transmission. Yes. Next in line, if we go to the bottom right-hand corner, we can see um, the pandemic with low transmission but high mortality. Uh, in that box, the example given is the H7N9 avian flu from 2013 to 2018 with 30% mortality but uh, around 2,000 confirmed cases, so very low transmission there. Yes, I wouldn't call this a pandemic, though. This is not a pandemic. This is outbreaks of this disease which occur occasionally. The disease has not, is not pandemic as such in humans, but it, is, it appears to be in, in birds. Right, thank you. Uh, and then finally, top right-hand corner, um, we can see in the pink box the pandemic with high transmission and high mortality rate. Uh, the example given there is the H1N1 to 1918 Spanish flu with around 3% mortality. Do, do you have any comment to make about that box? Yeah, that, it's always been interesting to me to see how virologists and others like to compare the current situation to 1918, which was a pandemic of influenza, but which also was an era when there were no antibiotics. And though antibiotics will not clear influenza, they will clear superficial bacterial infections that occur in the lungs when they've been um, robbed of their lining by influenza virus. And so the mortality was high. Much of that mortality was likely due to superficial bacterial infections. And so we don't really know the mortality from H1N1 Spanish flu directly from the virus. We only know that on top of that there were bacterial Okay, infections. so it could have been a combination of the virus and then the, the, the bacteria. That's generally the thinking, yes. All right, thank you. Just before we leave this table, are, are you able to assess where COVID-19 might appear in relation to the level of transmission and mortality? Mm -hmm. I, I would place um, the coronavirus, SARS coronavirus um, 2, um, on this table, <coughs> excuse me, let's see, I need to think a bit, I will. Um, I would place this virus, I believe, on the high mortality end, and so I would place it high transmission, high mortality. Right, so top right-hand corner in the yes. pink box. Thank you. We can take that down, please. What are the symptoms and clinical outcomes of SARS, or what were, what were the symptoms and clinical outcomes? SARS was a very severe respiratory infection which caused respiratory failure. People could no longer uh, breathe. Yeah. Um, the outcome of that was that there was a high case fatality rate of 10 percent. And in addition, many people who recovered had what's called pulmonary fibrosis, right. which means that their lungs were replaced the, the, the breathing, um, the area where oxygen exchange in the lungs occurs was replaced with fibers which didn't permit exchange of oxygen. And so some of those people still today have severe um, consequences from having had this infection. Are you able to, to say how the, the ongoing outcomes of SARS compare to those of COVID-19? It's too early yet to say the long-term effects of this, but certainly, um, like other viruses, including, for example, the virus that causes mononucleosis, there is a period afterwards where people are still fatigued, still sick, and, and in COVID-19, it appears that there are many, many more symptoms that are occurring in these people. Remember, this is an animal virus that had adapted itself to animals, and now it's in humans. Right, okay. Could you explain to us, please, the difference between asymptomatic transmission and asymptomatic infection? Asymptomatic infection is people who become infected with an organism and never show signs and symptoms. 
That's asymptomatic infection. So, so never any any development of any signs. Never develop signs and symptoms yes. from that virus. Asymptomatic transmission is when a virus or a bacterium, but when, in this case a virus, when a virus is being shed by the person before onset of signs and symptoms, and that can then transmit to others. And we know that occurs, for example, with measles, which is a respiratory infection. It occurs two to three days beforehand. And many virus infections are thought to transmit before um, the onset of signs and symptoms. Right, so, so, so asymptomatic transmission is the transmission before any signs or symptoms, but after which the person may well develop signs That's and correct, symptoms. That's correct, yes. Thank you. They will develop signs and symptoms. They will. Um, what a, just just to, to complete this part of your evidence, what then is pre-symptomatic transmission? Is that the same as asymptomatic transmission? I would say they're the same, yes. All right. Um, at paragraph 29 in your report, you say that SARS was transmitted primarily, but not exclusively, in healthcare and hospital settings, um, and that the majority of patients were adults between 25 and 70 years of age, and that the investigations did not identify groups at greater risk of serious outcomes after infection. Is that right? Why do you think there were so few suspected or confirmed cases of infection in children under the age of 15? Mm -hmm. As we understand this, it was transmitted in hospital settings by procedures yes. such as cleaning out of the lungs. And therefore, um, the, it was in patient, adult patient care areas. And the nurses who became infected or the health workers who became infected and transmitted it to others were transmitting it in adult patient right. wards, not in children's wards. With SARS, did infection provide immunity against reinfection? It's not known, it's not known, and it, there were too few cases to really study that. And so what factors led to its containment after a period of about six months, I think mm -hmm. you said? Well, those factors I reviewed earlier, it was the fact that it was very difficult to transmit from human to human. It required very close contact with droplet spread. The world worked together to limit travel to where outbreaks were occurring. Yes. And it didn't get into countries where there was poor surveillance, which might not have detected it and permitted it to spread further. That was the reference to Africa. That's correct, yeah. yes. And so it didn't become endemic in humans. It did not no. become endemic. All right. So, Professor Heyman, sorry, going back to something you said just now, you said transmission was thought to be in hospital settings, so um, it was by mm. treating adult patients that the hospital workers got infected and then they were dealing with adult wards. But why weren't the hospital workers then going home where there were children, so children would get infected that way? They did go home, and they did transmit it in the household, and some children were infected. But the majority of people who were infected were adults. When did the last known human infection occur, and how did it occur? The last known human infections of SARS coronavirus yes. 2. Uh, no, uh, coronavirus SARS coronavirus 1, one sorry. Yes. The last human infections of SARS coronavirus 1 occurred in laboratory accidents one in Singapore, one in Taiwan, and uh, several outbreaks uh, caused by laboratory accidents in China. Right. Let's move on to MERS, please. Um, First identified in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in June of 2012. Um, humans became infected from close contact with camels, as we heard yesterday. Um, was the route of transmission uh, between the species through droplets or bodily secretions or feces or, or the combination of all three? Between humans? Yes. Yes, um, in SARS, in, in MERS coronavirus, there is transmission from person to person by body secretions or by droplets or similar uh, close contact. It occurs in hospital settings called nosocomial infection when health workers don't practice uh, washing of their hands or when they're using equipment which has not been properly sterilized between patients. That's the major means in which 
MERS coronavirus transmits from person to person. How many cases were there in the United Kingdom? There have been five cases known in the United Kingdom, but three importations of the virus. So the virus was first imported uh, in 2012. Yes. Then since then, there have been two other importations, and one of those importations um, was transmitted to a person who had accompanied the, the patient and also to a visitor of the patient. Right. There was then a second major outbreak in the Republic of Korea in 2015 um, when an infected person returned home from the Middle East, so brought it from the Middle East, um, and became ill and was seen at various health facilities. Yes. Is that right? And again, substandard infection control at those facilities, um, which led to uh, the infection there. That's correct. There were many factors that uh, were thought to have caused this to spread so rapidly. One of those was the fact that the patient went to three different health facilities and the infection prevention and control measures in all of those facilities was substandard. Were poor, yes. We're going to come to that in okay. a moment. But in total, um, your report tells us that there were 185 cases in this outbreak with 38 deaths. Um, so that's that's a case fatality rate of 20% or thereabouts in the South Korea outbreak. Um, there were, you tell us uh, in your report, a series of factors causing um, the, the infection to spread. Um, and you've, you've begun to tell us about that. that there was weak hospital infection control um, weak patient isolation procedures, is that right, leading yes. to infection of, of other patients and family members, and also a nursing shortage. So that led to a dependence on private, less well-trained caregivers, is That's that right? That's correct. Yeah. And extremely crowded emergency departments without any isolation beds. But it was rapidly contained uh, was it not, Professor Heyman, within a couple of months? That's correct. Uh, and was that containment down to a change in policies in the hospital setting and an improvement in yes. the infection controls? That's correct. There was an improvement in infection control after retraining of hospital staff. There was also an increase in ventilation in hospitals, right. <clears throat> which dried out those virus particles. As, as we've already discussed. Yes. Yeah. And, and there was also um, uh, an understanding by the population because of good communication what this virus was doing and how to prevent infection. So there was a major effort at communication, which is always important right. in outbreaks. And does it follow from what you've just said that the, the main or the primary route of transmission of MERS was through droplets or aerosols That's in correct. the same way that, that we've um, described in SAR, with yes. SARS. Um, were there any super spreading events in relation to MERS? And, and can you describe to us what a super spreading event is, please? Yes, there were, there were um, super spreading events. In, in which virus? In MERS? In MERS, yes. Yeah. In MERS, there have been some super spreading events. Um, this was one in South Korea, yes. for example. And there have been events where there have been several different cases in hospitals where one person was admitted. But it's been very patchwork, the understanding of this virus, because there hasn't been clear and transparent sharing of information in many instances. Right. And what, what, what is a super spreading event in, in, in scientific terms? A super spreading event is when uh, a person who is infected for some reason or another is able to infect many, many other people. So it may be due to the fact that there are many people in a very small closed space and the person is able to transmit because he's at the right or she is at the right phase of transmission and then transmit. Super spreading events are events that occur when the risk factors line up in such a way that they can occur. All right, so, so what we have described um, happening in the hospital setting in South Korea, that would be described properly as a, as a super spreading event. That's a super e spreading event. Even something on that fairly yes. contained small scale. Yes. Right. Was MERS capable of asymptomatic transmission? 
It's not yet known whether right. asymptomatic transmission occurs among humans, but clearly it occurs from camels to humans. The disease is now endemic in camels. The virus is carried in the nasal passages and transmits quite easily to humans. Right. So it ha has it become endemic? It's endemic in camels, yes. Yes, but not in humans. Not in humans. No, right. Um, all right, well, that brings us to COVID-19. Um, it's no part of this inquiry to debate or to determine the origin of COVID-19, but um, you attempt to assist us in your report by setting out um, what you consider to be the theories of origin. Um, can you explain to us, please, Professor, uh, what those consist of? There are two major theories about uh, the emergence of this virus in yes. human populations. One is that it um, occurred, it came from a bat into an intermediary animal, and from that animal in humans, possibly at a live animal market. That's one hypothesis. Right. The other is that there was a laboratory accident at a major, highly secure laboratory in Wuhan. And that laboratory, we know, was dealing with bats that had coronavirus. And that laboratory, the hypothesis is that either the virus was able to escape um, from studies that were going on in a human who left and was infected, or through some other means. And the hypothesis then concludes in some instances, the other hypothesis is that the virus was being manipulated in such a way that it gained function, it gained the possibility of transmitting easily uh, between humans. So these are all hypotheses. And what's important from them is that there are messages that we can use. We need to make sure that live animal markets are conducted in the right way, that the animals that come to those markets are raised in conditions where they can't become infected. Right. And at the same time, there need to be better standards of laboratories, high security laboratories, and those standards need to be developed by the people working with viruses and adhered, adhered to by them. Right. So, so between those hypotheses, you aren't able to, to say which one is, is more likely or, or which one is, is more probable. Um, I'm not able to say that because I don't have the evidence. No, but, but they are both... They're both hypotheses, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, in terms of the sequence of events at, at the start of the pandemic and the global spread, um, are, are you able to explain to us, Professor Heyman, how that happened in, in the immediate outbreak in China and, um, and how that, that traveled around the mm -hmm. world? Well, there, again, are some hypotheses on this and some evidence from that. But it's felt that it was possible that the, the, the province where this outbreak began was suppressing information about it uh, for some reason or another. And that when the central government did understand that it was going on, they reported it to WHO. That's one of the hypotheses. That's what many people believe. Um, it doesn't really matter now what happened back then. We have to deal with the virus as it is today. And WHO, when they received the report on the 31st of December in 2019, um, the next day did provide information about it and then um, continued to provide information about the virus oh. through what's called the International Health Regulation System. Yes. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. And, and before we look at the the advice that the World Health Organization gave into that in a moment. And, and before we look at the, the advice that the World Health Organization gave in the immediacy of the outbreak, I'd just like to return to, to, to something that, that you've now confirmed in relation to all three of these coronaviruses, so SARS, MERS, and what we now know as, as COVID-19. You've referred to... Um, what I'm going to describe as a lack of candor or, or a, a lack of information, a, a lack of willingness to share information um, on behalf of some countries. Um, why is that such a problem? Well, when a country shares information about a disease, it often has economic repercussions. Yes. For example, um, if a country says that they have cholera, uh, then other countries may stop importing seafood from that country. Tourists may stop going to that country. And so countries don't like to report. And so 
in, um, in discussions at WHO, it was understood that because there's no international police, policing mechanism to force countries to report, yes. the way to do it was to change the norm so that countries understood it was expected and respected to report. And that's what the Director General of WHO did during the SARS outbreak in 2003. How did he do that? She actually announced publicly, uh, four months after the outbreak had begun, that China was not sharing information with WHO, and therefore WHO couldn't do a full risk assessment of what was going on. And what, what happened? Did that have a, a repercussion or an effect? That had a, an immediate effect in that the Vice Premier, Madame Wu Yi, immediately traveled to Geneva, um, apologized to the Director General, and immediately began to share information in China, was able to stop the outbreak very the outbreaks throughout China very rapidly. So after that, it's become understood that it's expected and respected, and most countries now continue to report, including right. China. And what about MERS? Was it was the same procedure adopted in relation to the concerns about a lack of information sharing there? There was hesitancy of the government of Saudi Arabia to report at the start, and one of the doctors who had been treating the initial patient thought it was SARS coronavirus one, and he did a genetic sequence and put that public publicly that sequence publicly. And fortunately, it was in the public domain because that's how the UK knew that they had a case imported. Right. And then, more recently then, with, with COVID-19, what concerns? That information very rapidly and acted upon it. Right. These were countries that had had SARS previously, and they were very attuned to, SARS, to coronaviruses. All right. Well, well, we'll return in a moment to, to deal with those countries and what perhaps could have been learned by mm -hmm. their experiences uh, and why they were able to, to react so quickly to, to yes. COVID-19 when, um, when it started to spread. But, but returning for a moment, please, to the, to the initial outbreak, um, what reports and recommendations were provided internationally by the World Health Organization uh, about travel or, or travel restrictions? Mm. Uh, about travel or, or travel restrictions? Mm. Well, WHO um, recommended in its first emergency, second emergency committee meeting after that, WHO took the recommendation of the emergency committee which said that there should not be an interruption of travel and trade, especially um, for humanitarian purposes, if it was required to ship goods or other, uh, other equi equipment to countries. And do you understand and concur with that advice? In general, I do, yes. In fact, the best defense against the spread of international infections is good, strong national surveillance and detection mechanisms. Right. And what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that countries have surveillance systems which can detect unusual events very early. Yes. Whether it's reported from a community or reported from an emergency department or from the health system in general. And, and that, in your opinion, it is a is a better um, that the surveillance is, is a better method of of controlling an initial outbreak or reacting to an initial outbreak than travel restrictions. Yes, because infections can travel asymptomatically in yeah. persons who don't develop signs and symptoms until they've crossed that international border. Yes. And so it's a false security to think that borders can stop infections. In later modules to this inquiry, we will look at the advice which was issued for uh, preventing the infection spreading throughout the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, but laying the groundwork now in terms of mask wearing, if I may. Um, at paragraph 83 of your report, uh, you confirm that um, the World Health Organization on the 29th of January of 2020 recommended wearing a medical mask alone during home care and in healthcare settings in the community, um, that that offered adequate protection against transmission if combined with hand hygiene and other infection prevention and control measures, but that a medical mask was not required for individuals without respiratory symptoms in a community setting, and that there was no evidence at that time on its usefulness to protect non-sick persons. 
Yes, that's, that was WHO's recommendation. Yeah, and, and do you have any comment to make about that advice that was provided on the 29th of January? Well, that was solid advice to prevent transmission in care settings, and it was very important, and medical masks have been recommend, were recommended for health workers. And, but it wasn't until much later, I think, in, in 2022, that the World Health Organization unreservedly recommended mask wearing for the general public whenever there was a need to increase, did to decrease community spread. Um, but uh, you would say, I, I presume, Professor, that by that time, there was so much more evidence available. That's right, and WHO doesn't like to make recommendations without an evidence base. They don't like to make precautionary recommendations, which are recommendations which would be modified as evidence comes in. So would you agree with a description that the initial advice back in January of 2020 um, displays a hesitancy of the World Health Organization in, in advising that, that mask wearing was appropriate? Or, or, or is it your um, evidence, Professor, that, that in fact that was solid comp uh, taking into account the very limited amount of evidence that was present at that time? Yes, WHO has said that the reason they didn't recommend earlier is because they didn't have the evidence to make that recommendation. All right, and as you just said, that, that the evidence base is extremely important. It's very important, yes. Yeah. For, for the world. But there can be precautionary measures that are made, the recommendations that are made, which were not made by WHO at that time. Even taking into account that COVID-19 is a, is a fairly recent disease, are you aware of case studies in China um, around the asymptomatic transmission of the virus? There was um, a study early on about asymptomatic transmission in a household, but again, um, the case definition was not clear what was being used, and it was not really, it was published, and it was peer-reviewed early on, but it wasn't really clear that this was um, a, an article to be followed. There were a very few number of family members involved. The evidence really came from Singapore when they were able to look at seven different clusters of persons who were <coughs> infected and were unable to link them to people who had clinical signs and symptoms. Right. But people who they were able to link them to in contact, some of them did later on develop signs and symptoms. All right. You've mentioned again there the case definition. <coughs> Are you able to help us, Professor, with, with how the case definition of COVID-19 may have altered over time mm. based upon the increasing evidence? Yes, early on the case definition in China, for example, was a, a case definition of a very serious illness which required hospitalization. Yes. So they only were finding those serious cases because that's what they were looking for when other cases were likely occurring as well. Right. Could I ask you to explain for us, please, the, the reproductive number? Just uh, before you do, can yes. I just pause? The transcript's not running. Are there any problems? I think mine is, my lady. Oh, is it? Oh, maybe just it's me. <laughs> oh, I seem to stop rolling. Sorry, forgive me. It was just me. Not at all. <laughs> Um, I was asking you, Professor, about the, the reproductive number. Yeah, okay. Can you explain to us what it is and, and how it relates to, to COVID-19, please? The reproductive number is the number of people who become infected from a person who's able to transmit the virus or bacteria. Right. So if a reproductive number is four, that means that one person can infect four other persons, provided there's no immunity among the persons to which that person is exposed. Yes. All right. And in relation to COVID-19, has the reproductive number dropped over the course of time? Reproductive numbers drop as the number of people in a population become immune, either from vaccination or from disease. And so the reproductive number has dropped um, in, uh, in the UK, for example. It's now thought to be less than one, yes. which is what cannot sustain transmission. Right. Could we display, please, paragraphs 99 to 101 of Professor Heyman's witness statement, his report, 
which is at INQ 000 195846. Thank you. I'm just going to, to read through this uh, with you, Professor Heyman, um, de dealing with the, the various symptoms of COVID-19. Um, it's currently estimated that up to 33% of those infected in highly vaccinated populations do not develop recognizable signs and symptoms of infection after vaccination or on reinfection. <coughs> Except for those with comorbidities, including obesity, the rest have a broad range of mild to severe signs and symptoms that can include a new and continuous cough, anosmia, that's loss of smell, agusia, that's loss of taste, and a range of non-specific signs and symptoms, including shortness of breath, fatigue, loss of appetite, myalgia, that's muscle ache, sore throat, headache, nasal congestion, stuffy nose, runny nose, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Decreased blood oxygen saturation is a hallmark of serious illness after infection with SARS-CoV-2, and complications include respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, that's ARDS, sepsis and septic shock, thromboembolism, and or multi-organ failure, including acute kidney injury and cardiac injury. And if we can just move up, please, to complete this at paragraph 101. Infections in the elderly and in others from deprived areas and or from certain non-white ethnic backgrounds have caused more serious illness and death. Underlying health conditions such as diabetes and chronic renal disease, as well as obesity, likewise increase the risk of severe disease and death in adults. Now, that collection of symptoms and effects um, were not known about on the immediate transmission back in December of 2019. So does that picture build over the course of time uh, as... Um, as the, the as as the transmission increases, and and uh, we are able to see a variance in terms of the case definition, and does that expand? Yeah, <clears throat> yes. This is called the natural history of infection. In right. Fact. All the signs and symptoms that are associated at one point or another with infection, and it does modify as more information is obtained, and focus is not on persons who are seriously ill, but on persons who have a positive diagnosis but have um, less serious illness. And this often depends on being able to identify an infection by a laboratory test. Right. And why is it, Professor, that um, symptoms may be more severe for those who have comorbidities, in particular obesity? Well, in obesity, uh, it's thought that there is a physical component to that, whereas it's very difficult in an obese, for an obese person to breathe at times, especially when there's a pulmonary infection, making it very difficult to exchange oxygen. Right. At the same time, uh, persons who are obese have a greater risk of uh, diabetes, too. And diabetes decreases the immune response to infections. It's known that that occurs with bacterial infections, and it also occurs with viral infections. Right. Thank you very much. We can take that off the screen now. Um, just before we, we break, I'm conscious of the time, my lady, and how long the stenographer has been working. This I was wondering about there have been some difficult words to yes. transcribe. Um, is that a convenient motion? Well, it is, yes. Very well. I think probably we'll take a break. Um, I shall return at 20 past 11. Thank you. All right.